All right, guys, welcome to the Second Line Show, the very first Second Line Show. Annie McDonald is going to join us here in just a minute, but I want to introduce you to who we've got with us today. We've got Mike Everhart, who, well, Mike Everhart's up here uh, for me. <laughs> Mike Everhart, who is a voiceover actor and audiobook narrator. And then we've got Ann Charles and Carrie Schaefer, too amazing best-selling authors who've agreed to join us on this first show and we are really looking forward to getting to know you guys getting to see what you guys do why you do what you do and how these things between narrators and authors and audiobooks work together we're going to do a little chat about some some cross-genre books i know mine is cross-genre i love to write cross-genre so we're going to talk a little bit about those things and we've got lots of people joining us hi diane and Rena and Serena Self is here. Love her. Hi, Serena. So we'll be checking in with some folks as we go. Um, Annie's going to join us just as soon as she can. Some tech issues going on with her, but she'll be here shortly. So guys, give your shout outs to Annie as well. She's coming. So what we have first, guys, because we are cool. And like I said, I have an addiction to iMovie. Oh, wait, here comes Annie. Hang on. Annie's here. Yay. Hey. Oh, it oh, I got so scared. <laughs> You're good. I'm never going to get in. No, oh, you made it. Awesome. You're looking well. Good to see you. Thank you. Hello. All right. So here's something cool I made for Annie and, you know, because Annie knows how. <laughs> Y'all, we had a, like a TV show going oh, here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, know, I, I should have been doing so many other things today. <laughs> I love it. That's fun. Yeah, well, it's right. But no, we're going to play with iMovie and Canva. This is what we do. All right. So we've got an opening for our show, and we are so glad to see you guys. Um, we're going to start off today with the one and the only Annie McDonald. And this is Annie's. Book Buzz Corner. Annie's ah. gonna share. Oh my so gosh, look at me, adorable. Two, two of me. <laughs> All right, Annie, the floor is yours, my dear. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I miss being on the air. This is very strange. So, first of all, you know we're already into the middle of August. So, I know I'm. I've tried to post as many book reviews or book books that I'm reading. So books that I'm reading for fun so far have been uh, I've been reading one to watch. I don't know when it came out, honestly, but it took forever to get here. So order it now. You might have it in time for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, a, it's a wonderful Maybe. book. Uh, it's, it's like, um, you know, a girl that's plus size, but she, she goes back to um, it's like, um, what do you call it? Mm, what is that show? Bachelorette. Dumpling? Bachelorette. Oh, Bachelorette. It's like a Bachelorette show for a plus size girl. And all that. Sure. With that. It's, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful reading. It's hysterical. And then I started reading uh, Self Care as well, which is another wonderful story that I'm not seeing a lot of people talking about. So I thought I'd give it a shout out because it's another great story. Um, but for just this week alone, of course, I have thousands of books that I want to share. But I'm going to, I've chosen uh, three. And um, of course, Hank Philippi Ryan, The First to Lie. Yes. Came out August 4th. It's an amazing uh, thriller that everyone has to read. Her, her pretty typical cat and mouse game book with two females and um you're not going to know who is the cat or who is the mouse until it's over pretty much till the very last line and it's it's a lot of fun to read as always in books and i just read before you go it just came out today and it's a very imaginative story about a young boy pondering the meaning of his life. And when you read it, you'll know why. It's like the before life starts where people are born with holes in their hearts. So they truly don't know the meaning of their life and they're in search of it. 
But aren't there so many of us that feel that way? Uh, and yeah. then it goes on to, to the end of uh, people's lives and stuff. It's very, very wonderful writing. He's as poetic as these leaves look coming down on the cover. It's just beautiful. It's a beautiful, it, and it's Tommy Butler's uh, first book like this. He's just phenomenal. Um, he's an actor and everything. And Darren Strauss, he's about to come out with this book. Everyone needs to reorder The Queen of Tuesday, which is about his grandfather's real life affair with Lucille Ball. Oh. Wow. So much fun. Uh, Darren Strauss is a phenomenal guy, as is Tommy Butler. I love them both to death. Um, but Darren, I was supposed to interview both of them. So, you know, y'all, this is killing me to just give a 10 second snippet. But um, I've been asking them for an interview since for a long, long time ago. So, um, but this book is fantastic. Carly Ray is going to do the interview instead. And she's, oh, she's, awesome. she's awesome. I love her. Yeah, so she's doing the interview tonight instead. And uh, anyway, so we're, we're in talks about doing something, hopefully, about this book. Because I'm in love, enamored with this book. And, and she, Lucille Ball was always on Monday nights. So he has a very quirky reason as to why he called it the Queen of Tuesday. Nobody likes Mondays. So who's going to pick up a book, the Queen of Monday? <laughs> I love it. That's right. I love it. Thank you, Annie, for yeah. that. Everybody's making their list, and Diane said she's got to get her list started. Um, Elgin's here. Hey, Elgin. Elgin is letting us know that he is reading The Amsterdam Deception by Tony Olivier, who's awesome. That's a great book, too. And a new release uh, by a friend of mine, Joanna Evans. Um, she has Sinai Unhinged, which is really awesome. She just took over Kemp Camp, Laura Kemp's Facebook page, um, I guess it was yesterday, the day before. Um, and she had a whole lot of fun over there. So um, her book is out there now and another great thriller for everybody to read. Um, so let's get going with you guys. Since we've got you here, I want to hear everything that you've got going on. So well, for Nola, everybody yes. Pre-order Carrie Schaefer's book on her other pen name, A Borrowed Life. Carrie Ann. Hang on, let me make you bigger so everybody can see it. There you go. <laughs> she has a right. book coming out of about women of age, like me. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you They're for sharing that. Everyone needs to pre-order that book. It's a wonderful book coming out in September. I had to, I had to give it a plug. Thank awesome. You. Thank you for doing that, Annie. And congratulations, Carrie, that book coming out. Always Thank exciting you. stuff. Yeah. All right. So for those of you who might be just kind of coming in and joining us, we do have Mike Everhart, who is a voice actor and narrator of audiobooks. Dear friend of mine. Love Mike so much. He's always so much fun and to I hang out with. And yes, and Annie's too. We adore Mike. Um, and I wanted to make sure, and Annie, it was like, it's like, you got to get Mike on here. Aww. Yes, we got to get Mike on here. Well, I so we wanted Mike. might need uh, a narrator for one of their books. There you go. So we wanted to make sure that Carrie and Ann got to meet Mike. Mike got to meet Carrie and Ann, and that you guys all got to meet all of them because it's an interesting um, dynamic when you are getting an audio book put out there. The authors see it on one side of things, and the narrators are going to see a very different process. So... Mike, since you are right here for me, um, okay. if you would let us know what you do and you know, kind of give us a little a little bit about yourself first as we get started, just for those who don't know you. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Everhart. I'm a professional voiceover artist. I kind of run the gamut uh, in terms of VO. I've done big commercials. I've done corporate narration. I've done phone hold messages. I voiced a talking trash can. And I also narrate audiobooks. And Audiobooks are my true passion. I did theater for a little over 20 years on stage, all musicals and things. And so performing for me is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, the commercial stuff pays better, but it's nowhere near as much fun as an audiobook because I get to play all these characters. Nolan and I have talked before I, I can play in, you know, in the theater. I never get to play a villain. I don't get to play an evil character ever. And in an audiobook, I get to play everybody. And it's so much fun to come up with these voices and the moods. And I'm really passionate about it. And it's, it's a great time. Um, I've done, I'm working on my 14th audiobook right now, and uh, 
it's a lot of fun. I've got one that's releasing here, hopefully in the next month. ACX has kind of taken a long time to get it through. But that's what I'm all about. I, I love doing voiceovers. I have a great time with it at my own little studio called Super Fun Studios. And I've got a great little home recording studio. And I record every day and do books every day and commercials every couple of weeks. And I just love it. It's what I live for. Thanks, Mike. Carrie, you're up there on the top row with Mike. Go ahead. Let us know a little bit about who you are, what you do. Okay, so I'm Carrie Schaefer. I am also Carrie Ann King. Thank you, Annie, for the lovely little plug. So speaking of cross genre, <laughs> as Carrie Ann King, I am kind of all about stories that are building people up and people in the process of finding their best life I, really is the theme of, of most of my Carrie Ann King books. As Carrie Schaefer, I go to the dark side and it's uh, super fun because I can't leave humor behind. So I write some stuff that's a little scary and a little twisted, but it also has a lot of really dark humor in it. Like, you know, I have a vampire who's 80 some and he have teeth. But I also managed to scare people, I guess, which just always makes me laugh because I don't really like scary stuff myself, but apparently I'm writing it. So um, anyway, I am writing full time right now. I also do video cast podcast stuff um, like Mike. I love my life. It's just absolutely it's my dream come true. And every day is fun. I, you know, even even under quarantine, because mostly I'm still doing all the same thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mike and I have had that conversation too. His life has not changed since Corey. Not much. Not much. <laughs> not much. I love it. Well, no. Yeah. I, I've added Dudley to the mix. If you keep seeing me look away, it's because I'm trying to toss him treats to keep him from crying at me. Mommy's <laughs> so, attention is elsewhere. This is not going to fly with this little 10 pound you know, beggar boy over here. <laughs> so that's what, that's what I'm doing. And tell us about your books. I love what you do. I have never seen, never met anybody who writes Westerns quite the way that you do. Oh, thank you. Well, I, it's a big mix genre mess all over the place. I have five different series. Um, each is a little bit different, different mixes. Uh, like Carrie, I do a lot of, um, dark humor, you know, they're dark subjects. The Deadwood Mystery Series, which is um, my biggest, both in number of books and um, favorites wise for readers, that is, um, I, there's some dark subjects, there's some uh, dark villains and, you know, frightful stuff in there, but yet it's full of humor because I think um, I like to deal with anything with, as long as I've got humor, I can make it through trouble, mm -hmm. sadness, scary stuff, you know? So that's the same with, um, my heroines. A lot of times it's, it's dark, it's freaky, it's supernatural, but yet we're laughing our way through it, you know, as we nearly die. So that's, you know, I have that series, which is, it's Western because it's set in Deadwood, South Dakota, but it's contemporary. So there's a mix of mystery, there's humor, there's a little romance which is a lot of combo that I put in each of my series. Um, I have an Arizona Jackrabbit Junction series that's set down in Southeastern Arizona, and that has no supernatural, but the mystery, the romantic suspense, the humor, lots of humor again. Then I have the Western, like we talked about, the Deadwood Undertaker series, which is 1870s. Uh, I write that with my husband. Um, it's I, I love it because it's the first time I, I grew up reading westerns as well as Stephen King and romances. You know, I was all over the place reading. So to get to write, um, be part of a western is like a dream come true because on my own, I don't know if I could. There's so much research that has to go into getting it right. Anyone who writes anything historical understands that you can't just oh, she was wearing this today in Regency romances, you will get, right. you know, you're, you, the fans will let you know. So mm -hmm. I, I love the Western um, mix with Supernatural Western, um, lots of humor again. And we, we have that going, which is a prequel to the Big Deadwood series. And then I have an archeology span mystery, funny humor series down in Mexico, the Yucatan that I also have. Um, and there's another one, but it's the Crazy Circus series with uh, shapeshifters. That one's just like cartoon characters craziness. Um, so yeah, I, I love to mix the, the genres. Um, and Carrie, it made me think, you know, when you were describing your books, I, I should check some of them out because it's that same kind of thing that I lean towards is a humor yet some dark wit and twisty stuff that makes people 
you know, a little nervous or, or cringing, but yet they keep reading and laughing. So right, right, and mine's totally, um, totally also that cross genre thing because I it's a little bit horror. It's kind of cozy mystery, but totally not because there's lots of swearing and yeah. uh, you know <laughs> violence happens. But yeah. it's set in a retirement home community and uh you know and it's definitely mysteries because we're right. solving you know who done it uh anyways it's just i love reading a mix like you i loved what you said i love reading all the different books and so why stick to one genre when you go to write if you can the more you can bring it, the more fun it is right right it's a i feel the same fun. way it's a little harder sometimes to find readers, I think, because they want to go, oh, are you cozy? Or they okay. want to, um, and, and if you want to sell in a store, they want to yeah. put a label, you know, and you're like, yeah. well, I'm a little bit of everything. Right. So sometimes, but when, I think when you find the readers that like the mixed genre, they are wonderful, amazing readers that are rabid and looking for more of it and more of it. And I don't mean rabid in a horrible way. I mean in a good way. Right? <laughs> Given that we're writing way. paranormal stuff here, rabid could have a whole other <laughs> yeah, Rabid from the mind. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I think that there's so much that uh, the cross genre has to offer that people are not recognizing. And I didn't recognize it until I read Laura Kemp's book. Um, Evening in the Yellow Wood. Uh, Great book. You know, she she asked me to review her book. I was like, uh, what genre is it? She said cross genre. I was like, yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> For a second. You know, because like, I'm like, I'm history, historical fiction, thriller. Like, this is my lane. Cross genre is not. But I was like, you know, I really liked her. Heard a lot about the book. So, I, of course, I read it. Fell in love with it. But it wasn't just the story. It was the fact that it opened 10 different avenues of other books that now I can go down. Right. I didn't realize yeah. I did like horror. I didn't realize I liked magical realism. I didn't realize I was interested in reading books about shamanism in store in fiction. Mm -hmm. I always read fact, factual books about shamanism. Yeah, I didn't realize I was interested in that type of storytelling. So then it was like, where's my next cross genre book? You know, um, because I know that the envelope would open more because that new author would introduce more genres into their story. So then this is right. how the review came to me, Nola, uh, and and then when Carrie mm -hmm. said, "Hey, do you want to read my the the vampire books in the motel?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." You know, and um, do you have a cover of it? The cover? I do, actually. These are my uh, my independent. This was when it went to a small press, and I got them back, got my rights back, and I recovered them. So I'm very oh, proud of my new cover. Hang on, let me find you. Let me put you up there, big screen. There we and, go. Now we can see them. The Thank you. I listened to it on audio, y'all. <laughs> Well, I started listening to Dead Before Dying on audio, and I I really was getting into it. I was like, I mean, I gotta go to the other stuff. I gotta go teach a class. You know, I'm like, I'm a teacher. I'm like, I can't be listening to audiobooks all day as much as then I end up doing, you know, all the other stuff. But I I love the attitude of our main character in Dead Before Dying. I love that she's got some age on her and some experience, and she's not just, you know, taking this young doctor's word for it. You know? no. I mean, all of those things. I, I love that intro to it. I mean, it's it's fantastic. Just the, the attitude of the character is, is so much fun to read. I did want to hear if I was listening to it. But, and the, the cross genre thing, Annie, you're exactly right in this way I feel about it. It, it does, like Anne said, it becomes harder to market. Um, it's it's harder to kind of tell people. But when you can open those doors, you find lots of new readers I and mean, kind of like, like Annie, your experience with Laura and you, you would not have read horror. You wouldn't have read my book unless you had read Laura's and realized, Oh, wait a minute. I do it have doesn't have to be, you know, horror. It's not Stephen like, King. It can be like a lot of other Laura's, things. Laura's <laughs> book scared me in a few places, terrified me. And then I said, Ooh, I like that. You know, so yep. I wanted more. I wanted more. And it, it was something I never thought I would like. And I realized, there's such a huge market they're missing out on. They should be putting these books on horror shelves, on every genre that these books are in, they need to be on. Yeah. They need to be on all of these shelves. They don't need to be stuck in a cross genre, not that you're stuck. 
<laughs> but they don't, you, shouldn't be on your, you, you shouldn't be only on that shelf, I don't think. I think that if somebody's looking for a horror, you should pop up too, is what I'm saying. Because yeah. you are a horror book, right? Because you are for that. And I, I think that 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 will be, I'm sorry, I stutter and stuff. No, you're fine. I think that that will become, become important the more we walk this path with the cross genre. And it also opens up opportunities for authors that, that they don't have to stick to such a, you know, a certain line when they're writing. Right. I think that's, that's a valid point. I mean, so, so often, you know, if you let an author take the reins and say, I'm going to write what feels good to me, what I really enjoy writing, you're going to get a great story. If you feel like you have to really kind of narrow that story down and what it is you want to say to fit a particular genre, oftentimes you're going to lose some parts of the story that may even be the best parts. I and mean, scraps paper could be the best part. Yeah, it really could. And so I, I love the cross genre thing that it, it's actually, you know, becoming more of a thing now to actually say that you, know, you write cross genre and it's, it, it doesn't have to pigeonhole you as an author. It gives you that, that freedom to write your best book, whatever that is, whether it's The Vampire with No Teeth, which I love Nancy's comment there. She was cracking up. She used to be in the dental field. <laughs> it's like, that's hilarious. Oh, and Nancy um, Ann wanted to know what is hanging out there behind you, your little buddy back there. I know we were talking about it in the, the green room, but. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, can't, I can't do that in reverse there. Yeah. Yes, it's a. Uh, <laughs> It's my brother's mummy. I, as I told these guys, I, I'm hanging out at my brother's house today. He does all my cover artwork and the illustrations in my books, and he loves horror. So, this guy hangs out here all the time. And I was telling them during fall, he'll put it out in the main rooms. And I've, I've spent the night here before with my nephews and nieces. And and that guy <laughs> makes me nervous. I don't like him in the middle of the night at all. In the daytime. <laughs> It's a mummy that belongs to your brother. It's not your brother's mummy. This thing would have taken a it's much mommy. different turn. <laughs> okay, so that's a whole new idea for a book. Sorry. You know. At some point, it's going to attack Anne during this show, isn't it? Oh my God. It's not <laughs> him. Come on. Exactly. Everybody watching, like, look behind you, behind you. Oh, this is a whole other show. <laughs> I don't know why this show is called The Second Line. We can have a funeral right there. That's right. Just start our jazz funeral with that guy. We're ready to go. <laughs> but back to the book, like Anne, Anne's books, like when I read Anne's, Anne's book, the Driftwood book, oh my God. Deadwood, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she would tell you, during the interview, I was like, like I couldn't stop. <laughs> I was beat red, I was so excited about the whole story, the the way she built everything up. I was like, you have a city, you need uh, you need games, you need this, Do you, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Yes, 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 Annie, I am, I am. Uh, but I was just dying, like I couldn't, you know, she's written like 70 something books. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> I'm being, Close. just being like, right, right. like she's written a huge amount of books on this town that she's created with so uh, obviously multiple things are happening within these towns. So you could pick up a, whichever book you choose and then build around that, you know, right. but fall in love with her main character. And she's just like Nola said about Carrie's character. You know, she's amazingly strong, uh, but you've watched her grow. Uh, right. But yeah, she's one of these women that you're just like, yeah. Yeah, she's all, and she's curls and curves. I mean, she's had twins, so her body is not perfect. She's in her mid-30s. She has relationship troubles like crazy she has had in the past. I mean, she's just trying to be a single mom, raising these twins as best she can uh, on a single income and trying a new career at the start of the series as a realtor. And she's, frankly, she sucks at it out of the gate. So, you know, I, I wanted a heroine that was someone like maybe me. If I, you know, was, I'm not perfectly a size, you know, super perfect looking everything, you know, I wanted just a regular person that 
is funny and handles the, the crap thrown at her with a sense of humor and keeps pushing. And yeah, it's, and what was cool, what's cool, um, Annie, and I think we talked about this in the interview is all of my series crossover. So you'll have in the Jackrabbit series, you'll see characters from Deadwood series or from the dig site series there. So it's really fun because because I'm an indie author and I don't have to worry about a publishing house, you know, having rights to something that I can have anything I want to happen in Anne's world, you know, um, which is great with crossover characters. If you like that kind of a thing as a reader. Um, yeah. Remember when we were kids, I don't know, watching the love boat and you'd see somebody from fantasy Island on there or somebody else. You'd be like, Oh, you know, it's that kind of, you know, oh, this is so fun. Cha cha can be on again. You know, <laughs> oh my god, cha cha. Remember her? Oh man, she was on. So yeah, it's it's kind of fun like that too. I enjoy I enjoy having that freedom. And crossover, and because it's a mixed genre, I can pull those in from different genres, which is fun right. too. It's Very so cool. Fun. And then Noah's fun. book. Oh my god. <laughs> and hers is like that's why I said you got your three of you need to talk because like Noah's books are the same uh, they're you know they're scary yeah Sin is scarier <laughs> yeah, Crescent City <laughs> Sin gets a little worse yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, I just I just read both of hers in the last two weeks um, when I was supposed to be writing I would I would take <laughs> off and read it <laughs> so that I could I could catch up and yeah, it was a lot of fun. I just, and I love the setting um, and learning so much stuff. So, and all the different voodoo and, and magical and supernatural. Yeah, that was great. Well, you know, you're exactly right about your readers being able to call you on things if you don't do your homework. And so, uh, so much of my process with that series and really any series that I write, because I do tend to write historical fiction or there's history embedded in um, the next series that's launching is Traveler. And it's, it's, modern day, but she's being pulled into past lives. So there's a lot of history in there. Um, you have to get that right. And you know, for me, it's about doing the research first and building the fiction in around the fact so that there's nothing to distract the reader from the story. So if the setting is authentic, if the clothes, the food, just whatever they would be doing is truly authentic to that time, then you can play with everything else. And so for me, with the the historical fiction and then bringing in so much of the magic and the voodoo and all of those things, it, it really walks that line between the believable and the unbelievable. And so when you have all of the details of that setting, which is really a magical place anyway, and one of those places that that's so much, you know, you can get away with a whole lot in New Orleans that maybe not other places. <laughs> they believe a whole lot more in New Orleans than they do in other places. So when you walk that line, it's very easy to cross that line and bring your reader with you. So if you if you have that realism embedded and then you take them over that line with that with the voodoo, with the magic, then they're more willing to go with you on that right. ride and just kind of suspend that disbelief because everything else around it is so concrete. And, right. you know, especially if they've ever been to New Orleans, you're going to know, you know, these things are, you know, this is the way it is. It's still that way today. And you can kind of take that that setting for what it is and add the, that magical piece to it. And I, I think that's one of the beauties of, of the cross genre of writing is, you know, there's so much embedded history and culture of New Orleans but it's this magical horror ride. This, you know, I can make it as scary as I want. And there are so many stories in New Orleans that, you know, are right along with this one. You know, it's, this is a different story, but there are so many other ghost stories, so many other tales like this, you know, events like this, that the people of New Orleans have really taken on as much of their as their history as legend. You know, legend and you know, right. truth and fiction in New Orleans are pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I mean, you, you can't really tell because it's just like, I don't know, maybe that really did happen. <laughs> right. People say it did. You know, we're going to go with that. Now it's like in the history books. So yeah, it, I love that that cross genre for that that ability to to really play with the story you want to write, the characters you want, what you want them to say and do how you want that adventure to go without feeling so constrained by that genre that you feel like you have to fit on that shelf to, to right. be part of. 
And I would rather find a table at Barnes and Noble for like, you know, this kind of weirdo author than to find my spot on a shelf because I'm never going to be somebody who's going to fit on a shelf. I'm just not. So I, I prefer that. I prefer that, you know, here's the weirdo writer's table. That That's the space for me, really. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> that's my that I was the queen of the misfit books, that that was the <laughs> I was going to take for myself. That's uh, perfect. Uh, Put that on a business yeah. card. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. I absolutely love it. Uh, Phyllis says she can't wait for the new book. Thank you, Phyllis. I'm looking forward to you guys reading it. Um, Elgin has got a recommendation for us for another um, another kind of fun book for you guys. Oh, I've read A Rocky Divorce. It is absolutely hysterical. If you guys love sassy, strong, foul-mouthed, um, heroines, you want to read a Rocky divorce because she's awesome. Rocky is our main character and uh, she finds herself embroiled in the uh, junior league of an Arkansas town. And so <laughs> she's, she is a trip. Absolutely hilarious. Um, Mike, a question for you when you're um, doing audiobooks, do you do different voices for each character? And if so, how do you keep them all straight? I know you and I have talked about this, but that's an excellent question, Erica. And since we were talking about characters and kind of the fun rides that we can take them on, um, tell us how you do that when you were actually bringing them to life. Before you answer, sure. Mike, I want to just say Mike is the cross genre of narrators. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Many, Thank you. you. Tell, tell her, also tell everybody how many you do it in one book. Okay, so I, to answer the question, um, Erica, Yes, I do different voices for every single character. I also do accents, whether I've done them before or not, I'll go learn them and put them into the book. And I'm not saying they're great or anything, but they're there enough that you get to feel, oh, he's French, he's Italian, he's German, whatever it is. And then, um, so for instance, this last book I did, it was a 12 hour audiobook. It had 57 unique characters and I did six different accents. And uh, some, like I'd never really done a French accent before. So I learned how to do a French accent. I'd never done a Russian accent before, so I learned to do a Russian accent. And uh, I wish I could just speak like off the cuff and do it, but you kind of practice it phonetically because I'm gonna, you know, it's a, the time period is very short. So you kind of reduce it to phonetics and figure out for line by line what you're gonna do. Now, the way I keep all these characters straight is when I create the character, and by the way, the character creation is absolutely bonkers. I'll put pens in my mouth, cough drops in my mouth, I'll cover my nose, I'll put my tongue in a weird spot, I'll only have my mouth open, I'll add a lot of air, I'll go, I'll wake up at three in the morning because my voice is low, or I'll do it 11 at night when my voice is fried, just to get that real kind of genuine character sound out. So what I do is once I decide, you know, I, I like the way this character's voice sounds, it feels right for the book, uh, I'll go ahead and do kind of like a, a painter, how they do studies of like shadows, and you'll see like 10 paintings of them practicing on a shadow. I will record myself and tell myself, here's who the character is, here's what I know about the character that's creating this attitude. Physically with my mouth, here's what I'm doing. Am I doing a good pucker? Am I holding my tongue in a very specific spot? What kind of inflections I'm doing? Is this character question everything? Is it up at the end of every phrase, down at every phrase? Uh, I'll just tell myself basically what I'm doing and then I'll read probably a minute, minute and a half worth of lines. And it's so important to do this because I'll have characters, this book that I just did, this 12 hour book, that one of the big villains in the book is in chapter four and you don't see him again until like in mid chapter 50. And so it's been, you know, three weeks or so since I voiced this character, I don't remember what I was doing, you know, what, what did I do? Right. And so then I'll go back and I'll hit play and I'll listen to him and go, oh yeah. And then I'll listen to the chapter that he's in and go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll be able to recreate it, practice a little bit and then recreate it and do it. But uh, I certainly do every single one. I, I Like I said before, I used to never get cast as villains. And so for me, it's a real treat to be like, oh, I'm this evil Japanese general now. Let's let's do this. And I just yeah. love it. It's so much fun, you know? When am I ever get to do that? Or, oh, I'm playing a fairy or I'm a troll or whatever it is. And right. it's just a hoot. I, I love it. I adore it. It's so much fun. So, yes, I do Mike is a villain. Mike is a villain is really kind of funny. Because, y'all, if you don't know Mike, he's one of the nicest people you will ever meet. So, Aww. Mike doing villains is just, it's its funny for me. I mean, I love listening to you do the bad guys because I know what a nice guy you are. So, I actually know what, what a leap and what a talent that really is. Thank you. Um, Carrie Thank and you. Anne, you're welcome. Carrie and Anne, for you guys to hear your books being brought to life by somebody like Mike, what is that experience like on your end as authors? Carrie, you can go first. 
Okay, well, I've done it um, several times now. So I, I have a trilogy that is um, uh, novellas, my, my Dream Wars trilogy. And the narrator that I had for that, uh, that was the first time that I'd had anything in audio. And it really honestly kind of freaked me out because it didn't sound like the character did in my head at all. Right. Totally, right. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, and I, I had this actual kind of meltdown, like, oh my God, I made a terrible story. She did a beautiful job. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and then after that, I was kind of ready. So when Terry, um, Terry Lynn, Lynn, uh, gosh, I know this woman. We talk all the time, and now I've forgotten her last name, and I'm going to kill myself for that later. Um, she's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Terry, please don't listen to this because I love you. <laughs> Um, Make sure she she married a bunch of my Carrie Ann King books for me. And so she actually approached me and she said, you know, I see that you have the Shadow Valley books and that you got your rights back. Have you ever thought about putting them in audio and do you want to do a thing on ACX? And so I was like, yeah, let's do it. I already knew her and her work. So that time I kind of knew, you know, what it was going to be, but she did some reading for me and then I gave her some feedback. I don't think this voice is quite right. You know, we got to do that, which was really fun. And then it's just wonderful to have it all come alive like that. I, I love it. I, it's so fun to have it be in, in audiobook. I, yeah. you know, fun, <laughs> fun is good. I want to come live at your house, Mike, or play. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you probably could, Carrie. He's in California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a long ways from me still. <laughs> and what about you? I have, okay, so I have about 28, 27 or 28 books narrated. Um, wow. And I have one re one narrator that I used for the Deadwood series, which is 12, the novels. Um, and then all of my other series, I use another narrator. Um, and she's through ACX, where the one that um, does all my Deadwood series is through uh, oh. Blackstone. So uh, it's two different, just to give you an idea, I've, I've, stick, I've stuck with the two because first of all, as, as most of you know, if you start with something, you really want to like them and stay with them because it'll drive your readers nuts if you keep switching narrators. So for long running series, um, I'm really fortunate that these guys keep staying with me. Um, and it's, it's the first, oh boy, it's so different as you know, Carrie, um, and, and Nola, if you've had audio, it's so, yeah different to hear um, everything come out. Now, what's really cool is when they nail the way you would say the expression, you know, if you were, if you curse or, or, you know, something and you're like, yeah, that was, that was it. <laughs> That's really cool. And sometimes I, I often, um, especially for ACX, I get to do a, a listen way before we go live so that I can see if there's anything said wrong, you know, something, if there's a problem and I'll walk, go for walks and stuff listening. And it's funny cause I'll get so into listening that I'll say the next line and then <laughs> and I'll go, yeah, I knew that line. And then I'm like, you idiot, you should. <laughs> you know it. You know it. But it's, it's kind of, it's very different than when you read your own writing to listen to it. And and that's really, it's wonderful. Uh, I do have, however, um, sex on the page. Not a lot, but a little. And I will tell you that that's not easy to listen to. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I don't, like, I'll listen to my whole audio books with my husband or with any, you know, my kids, if it's not, you know, there's no language in parts. But when we come to those scenes, I'm like, skip it. This is for me on my own. You know, I can only listen to this on my own. I can't have you there with me. Cause then it's like, we're all standing there together and it's, <laughs> it's, it's a fun, it's really fun and it's exciting. I do love um, the way you guys do voices, Mike. You get, it, it's an amazing thing when you get a really good audiobook reader or a narrator and they put the work into their voices and the accents and it brings it to lives. Um, I've had chills from stuff that I've been, I mean, my own books, I've read tons uh, of times, but she gives me awesome. chills. You know, or or a little kid where it's like, oh my gosh, and and now you know I'm on writing book twelve of the Deadwood series. I actually hear her voice when I'm writing a lot of times. Oh, wow, uh, fascinating! That, yeah, it really starts to sink into where you hear voices a certain way they're being done. She um, for both series, they're really my narrators are great. They do like um, what you said, Mike, where you go back and you know you say, how did I do that voice before? 
-hmm. What I'm impressed with is, you know, like 11 books in, in the Deadwood series, uh, Carolyn Schaefer's does that for me. And she goes, she knows, I mean, that voice is the same for each character through, which is, which mm -hmm. is wonderful for the readers because it, it brings it even more to life for them. So I think audiobooks are great because when you read a book, it's one thing, but when you listen to a book, it's a slightly different story. I don't know how to explain it. It's still the same story, but it feels different and it's fun. Mm -hmm. So I love that there's so many um, narrators willing to step forth and help us bring our stories to life in a different way. And narrators are all different. Yeah. Some, mm -hmm. some oh, yeah. Them, some read the book to you, some perform them. Yes, the yeah. performers are yeah. amazing. Some are yeah. I'm a performer type. I can't, I don't listen to the ones that just read it. I always like to listen to the ones that are performing. And then of course I'm a performer myself, but and, yeah, right. so I'm biased. That's how I first met Mike. I listened to uh, one of his books. I didn't know who he was. And I was like, who is this? And, and then one person read the book and I said, one person <laughs> did it, this? I was shocked. You know, it's just- Thank you. Someone. I've gotten that comment before. Someone will listen or I'll give a book to a friend and they're like, who did that book with you? I'm like, no, no, it was only me. Now, come on, who's the girl? No, no, that was me. So, yeah, no, that was so awkward. This last book I did, my friend's like, I have a really tight knit circle of friends who I shared the audiobooks with before they go up to ACX because I always like to get some feedback. Like, does this am I sound stupid when I'm doing this? What is this? And so he, he called me one day. He's like, you know, I know it's you, but I really want to meet this girl. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be here. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm like, you really don't. <laughs> Mike, I have, a, I have a question for you, Mike, coming from the author sure. world, um, especially like indie author. How do do people just contact you through ACX? They go in and find you and say, hey, are you willing to do a read and see what how this if this works? How do you have people uh, approach you to do books or you know, companies? It goes a couple different ways. So when I first started, I would go to ACX and I would just look to see what titles were accepting auditions. And I would audition for titles. And I still do that. The book I'm doing now is an audition with somebody I've never met, never talked to. Uh, but then uh, occasionally you'll you'll get um, a publisher or somebody who's written multiple books. Or in my case, I got lucky and Pandemoon had me do a book for them and they liked it. So they offered me another book and then they right. offered me another book. I ended up doing five for Panda. And so, uh, and also, a relationships, B auditions out in the middle of, you know, cattle call auditions. And then I will occasionally, someone will hear a book and will reach out and say, hey, would you read for this? I think you're right for this. Or, uh, you know, I check you, of course, on ACX, you can put a profile with your audio samples. And sometimes authors will go through and kind of troll like fishing, you know, pull the net and see what you can find. And so I'll get, uh, I'll get in contact that way too. Uh, so kind of those three ways are the, are the ways I do it. Gotcha. It's good to know. I've, I've often wondered because, like I said, I have stuck with the same narrator in ACX for since way back when, um, and it just I haven't, you know, since then I haven't had to go out and I and I hear from other authors their experiences with trying to find a narrator. So it's interesting to hear from your point of view what it's like, you know, coming working. Yeah, with it's always interesting for me because I'll go on and find a book, and of course, as a narrator. I mean, I spend so many hours in these books, right? I create the characters, I learn the accents, I get the story, I do the recording, I do the editing. I mean, I'm living these books. And so I always try to find a book that I'm interested in, that the story sounds interesting, it's engaging, because I've taken books for the for the money, and uh, man, that's a that's a slog. And so now yeah. I only do books that are good and fun. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an awkward process. You go in and you find the ones auditioning, you find the little blurb, and I usually go on Amazon and read the look inside, and I try to find stuff on Goodreads where there's previews or something where I can learn who are these characters and what do they want, and what are, they, what are their goals, and what's the story about, and uh, submitting a cold read, you know, because you're like, I don't know, is this guy a smoker and his voice is raspy or was he in the Marines and he right. shouts all the time or, you know, you just don't know. And so those blank kind of out in the cold auditions, you know, you're just like, oh, I hope that I hope the guy likes this. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but Mike, you said that you like live the parts, like Carrie's, like you'd be living in like a Ramsack hotel motel with old people. <laughs> you guys, I am crazy when I do a book. I I change he, like, like depending on where the book is set, like you joke, but it's really it. true. Like <laughs> I will watch only shows and like TV shows on Netflix or whatever in the genre of the book I'm doing. So right now I'm doing kind of like an Indiana Jones style adventure. I've watched all three Indiana Jones movies. I've started watching The Mummy. <laughs> I'm not watching any mysteries. I'm not watching any action show. The one I did Identity before, this was all thriller action. So I was watching 
Mission Impossibles and Born Identities. And it just kind of helps me connect with the emotions because those films, you know, they're a certain way. And so it really right. is helpful to kind of feel that. And then I'm crazy. I, when I record the chapter and edit it that night, when I go to bed, I'll listen to it at bed. I'll listen to it while I'm brushing my teeth. I go and exercise. I listen to the chapters. Like, and I don't listen to podcasts or music. I'm just listening to the work and it just keeps me engaged in the story and in that world. And it's kind of crazy, but you know, I, I get attached to the characters that way and it's a lot of fun. Right. Right. Isn't it cool to know that the characters mean so much to the narrator as the authors? I think that's so cool. It, I, I it's really that. true. It's yeah. really true. I heard there was a sequel coming out to a book I narrated, uh, Juggling Kittens, and Juggling Kittens 2 is coming out. I'm like, oh, please let me narrate. I want to connect with these characters <laughs> again and find out what's happening in their lives, and I want to express it and <laughs> live in their clothes again. I sound stupid, but it really <laughs> no, is fun. No, it's, no. It's, it's really a collaboration. I mean, if you don't have the narrator that's right there with you and doesn't get your voice or doesn't match your style it's like an awkward yeah. conversation where if you come together and it gels it's just like here you go and it's it makes the story even better i think right i agree There's and what really helped that oh sorry go ahead carrie That's okay. no you oh i was just gonna say what really helps for me at least as a narrator is when i first sign a book i love to have a conversation on the phone with the author uh, I'll have uh -huh. gone through and kind of picked out who some of the main characters are. And I'll ask, you know, what, what's your impression of this character? How are they? What's your, you know, how are you feeling about this? And try to get a feel for what the book is going to be like, what their vision is, and if they have particular voicings in mind and that kind of thing. I don't know if you're doing that with your narrators, but it's so helpful uh, for me, at least. It really helps build that foundation, not only of trust and working together, but more of like, I know what the project is. I know the art we're creating and who these people are, where the story's headed. It uh, makes a huge right. difference. Right. Love it. So Linda has a question and hey, Laura, Laura Kemp is here. We were talking about you earlier, Laura. Sorry you missed it, but we were. <laughs> good things, good things. Um, Linda's question is, so does the author ever sit and listen to the book being narrated and have input? So I know, Mike, you are working out of your house and with coronavirus, that's not really an option, but have you ever had that experience where an author has kind of come in and worked with you in person kind of as you're working on it or no? Never in person, but via telephone. Of course, I do commercials and stuff. I've been in studios where they're right there directing you. But uh, so far with audiobooks, it's been telephone. And uh, I'm sure Anne can speak to it on ACX. You can upload the chapters as you do them one right. at a time. And then you can, I'm assuming you can go in and listen to them that way. Um, yeah, she'll do, the, like with mine, uh, the, Lisa, Lisa Larson is the one who does a lot of my books through, through ACX. She will upload 15 or like a 15 minute sample right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, and let me hear it. And so, uh, you know, early on, it was a little bit different process because we were still, well, maybe this, maybe that, make her sound like this. But now it's more, you know, I listen to it and I go, oh, this is gonna be so good. You did such a great job on these, you know, first 15 minutes. So, and then she, you know, you accept that first initial and then they go on and, and do the book. So yeah. it is, we do get to listen. And then where Lisa's really cool, and I, I don't know your process, Mike, but she will, you know, you got to submit the files to the author to listen to, and we have to okay them. Uh, yeah. And she is amazing with working with me because, you know, my dig site books down in the Yucatan, there are some Maya words that are just, are the, the Mayan language is complex, and she goes through a lot of work to try to get them right. And she'll say, is this right? And I'll say, boy, I guess so. <laughs> you, know, you don't always know how it's pronounced as an author. You, it, we read it, but then she'll go yeah. do it. And be impressed um, with that, with how she'll come to me with how's the sound? Is this sounding okay to you? So it's really great when you get a narrator that's willing to work and really wants this this to shine. Yeah, um, I agree. I love the collaboration. Like I'll do I, what, I, what some authors don't want to have anything to do with it. They'll approve the 15 minutes and then they'll just approve the book at the end or whatever. But I've had uh, some collaborations. Project 137 was like this with Seth Augenstein, where I'll email him the chapters as I go. And then we'll have a phone conversation. What do you think of this? How's this direction going? And what do you think? And then we can make adjustments on the fly or just kind of, you know, kibitz about it and, and share the, the art experience. Because for me, I'm living it for the first time and I'm enjoying bringing it to life. But for the author, it's the first time they've heard it. It might sound different. It might sound better. It might sound worse. You know, it's fun to share. I don't know. I'm so. Yeah. I'm so no. We, we just we do some of that. Terry, Terry and I do some of that. Probably not as much as you do with with your authors, but um, yeah, she'll she'll narrate some, and then I'll listen, and you know, I'd come back and go, well, I I don't picture this this girl doesn't talk like that. <laughs> like she's she's I'm a teenager. She's not a valley girl. She's a little more you know, make her a little more goth. You know. <laughs> like, totally. Like, um, 
those sort of things. It, anyway, it's it's fun to be able to have that. And then sometimes there's just not that right emphasis. Like I really hear it one way in my head and I feel that it's not missing. And then, you know, she can go back and fix that. So it's it's fun. It's hard though to listen. It gets so sucked into an audiobook. It just, it, it sucks you in. So I'm trying to listen for things that I want to change and I'll just be listening along and I'll hear something I don't really think is, you know, it, it jars me a little bit, but I don't want to, because I'm keep listening and it'll be a little ways down there. And I'll, oh, no, no, wait, wait, I have to go back. <laughs> I have to go back and mark that because I just keep, you know, I just want to keep listening, but it's hard but to But that's so good. I mean, when I was driving, I mean, she would make me pull over just so I could be like, or, ah, <laughs> you know, I would just die. And it's, it, it's also, you know, of course the writing's so wonderful, Carrie, but it's her delivery of things. Yeah. It's so wonderful. You know, well, it's Terry. Terry really likes my characters. It's Terry Clark Linden is her name, by the way. Um, yeah. She loves that I'm doing older women and thanks me repeatedly for giving her those characters to do because as a person in that industry, um, she's also, you know, into movies and stuff. As you get older, you, the ageism is just huge. Yeah. So we talk about that, you know, a lot. Anyway, she she loves my my older feisty women characters. and uh, Awesome. Yeah. So it's fun for both of us. I am so glad we got all of you guys together to talk about this. This has been so fun to hear the different sides of things from Mike's side to, to the author's side. That's just so much fun that you guys are so invested in what each other actually does and that one can help, you know, really bring the other one to life. So that is awesome. You guys are fantastic. Um, I know if you guys, Carrie and Mike, if you guys need to pop out at any point, you guys just hop off when you need to. I totally appreciate your time, and I know everybody else does. We've got some other things that we want to talk about, though, that I'm hoping you might stick around for. Um, we're going to get into some New Orleans history and mystery here in just a little bit. So be thinking of your favorite ghost story or a ghost encounter you may have had. So this is where things go off the track. Remember we talked about things may go off the rails. Here's where we derail. Uh -huh. um, this is where we, okay. you know, the conductor is telling you right now, buckle up. <laughs> this is where things go. <laughs> um, but before we get into that, one of the things um, we're going to get into, um, we, we're trying to have segments on our talk show. So since we, we've mentioned Crescent City Sin, so just kind of for me here, um, Crescent City Sin is coming out in October it is the sequel to Crescent City Moon. Thank you so much yeah. for reading that. Um, Anne's gotten a sneak peek into that, and I am super excited to share that with you. If you've not read Crescent City Moon, go grab your copy so that you can get on this wild ride with our main characters. Yay. I know Annie absolutely loves Crescent City Moon. Uh, Selene makes her scream out loud. And so... <laughs> Selene is so much fun for me to write. Um, and Crescent City Moon is is so many fun characters that, that I loved to create Crescent City Sin. Um, I took them all down a very dark path. <laughs> and so um, it was a lot of fun to play with some of those, those, those magical practices and the voodoo rituals that we kind of glimpsed a little bit of in Crescent City Moon and really took a deep dive into the dark and gritty side of New Orleans and the magic, um, getting down to Gallatin Street where the brothels and the bars are and some crazy things that happen there as well. So Crescent City Sin um, is coming soon, just in time for Halloween to give you a good case of the creeps. So be on the lookout for those things. And I do truly appreciate um, Annie and Anne, both of you guys for, for reading that one for me and getting the word out about that one. Thank you so much for doing that. And as we get going, we have got some New Orleans mystery and history. Um, for me, New Orleans has always been a place where history lives and breathes. It is so much a part of the culture there. Um, like I said, um, and Patricia was commenting on that too earlier when I made the comment about, um, what did I say? Uh, no, was it Patricia? Was it? Who said it? Ah, I lost the comment. But it was really cool. It's kind of like truth and fiction yeah, I said, are the same thing. I said it. She said that um, she liked the comment when I said, which was very true. I said this all the time. Truth and fiction in New Orleans are pretty much the same thing. Um, they are. And so we're going to talk about um, one of my favorite things and is kind of those little things about New Orleans 
that makes it different from other cities. Things you may see there that you won't see anywhere else. And on NOLA's second line on my Facebook page, we were talking about the Romeo spikes. And for those of you who don't know, um, Romeo spikes are a really, really interesting stuff here. I'm gonna go full screen so I don't block anybody out with these things. Um, these are examples of Romeo spikes. And right here, as you see at the top of the pole, where the um, where they are holding up the gallery, we don't call them balconies in New Orleans, it's a gallery, that's what they call them. Um, the galleries there, and see this one is on the side here because apparently this next door house over here did not have Romeo spikes. <laughs> and so they had to put them over here on the side because uh -huh. you know, they don't have them there. Um, and this particular house right here, this is 823. Look at in the middle. <laughs> here they are. Um, and 823 Orleans, look at this beautiful little pink house. It's lovely little door. It's little blue shutters. And you wouldn't think anything about this, but Romeo spikes are exactly what they sound like. Um, these were spikes that were put at the top of these poles where they hold up the galleries to protect the virtue of the French Quarter daughters. <laughs> well, <laughs> prevented, yes. This wow. prevented illicit encounters, suitors from shimmying up the pole to the dog's oh balcony. Oh my there. gosh. Oh my um, god. I thought it was just to keep pigeons up. away or something like, don't let the birds <laughs> land here. Yeah. No, they, they are wow. Romeo, the Romeo and Juliet spikes. And Unbelievable. And Orleans, this house right here is one that I wanted to talk about in particular because there is actually a ghost story that goes with 823 Orleans and it is the story of the hanging boy. And here's how the story goes. I told this story on my Facebook group. So you guys who heard it, bear with me for just a minute um, as we kind of fill everybody else in on this story. So at 823 Orleans, um, a family had decided they were going to go out to dinner. And the teenage daughter decided that she was going to lie about her health. It said she wasn't feeling good and she wanted to stay behind. Well, she was staying behind because she had a secret suitor who wanted to pay a visit. And the family left. She ran downstairs. She unlocked the door for her suitor. He comes on in and dad forgot his wallet. So her dad comes back hearing what he thought was a burglar or an intruder upstairs near his daughter's room. He grabs his gun. He goes upstairs to take on this burglar and protect his fair daughter. Instead, finds her and her suitor in a compromised position. Fires a warning shot. As the young man goes over the balcony, um, he gets tangled up on the Romeo spikes and it basically it gores him on the way down and kills him. Uh, oh my the, God. the young man falls to the to the ground, the banquette, the sidewalk below. His intestines don't follow him. Um, oh, wow. Horrible, horrible story. Um, so that's yeah. true. That's, that's the fact. Okay, this is the truth. Uh, that story happened. That happened. Uh, the fiction that goes along with that is that now at 823 Orleans, if you are walking along there at night, you may see the shadow of the young man dangling from the spikes that are there, the Romeo spikes. Um, folks pass by that house and hear screaming and they don't know why a young man's screaming or they will walk under that balcony and feel blood dripping on their shoulder. Mm, <laughs> that's so, disgusting. Yeah, so there's the history and the mystery of old New Orleans and you can see why it inspires me so much to write what I write. Um, because that is a very fine line between fact and fiction. And so many times just the, the gruesome truth of New Orleans will spawn its own um, ghost stories and legends and lore that go on after that. So that is the story of those beautiful wrought iron things. I mean, this one is you have to ruin our favorite. I mean, look at this, how it just... I mean, they are hell bent that there's nobody's getting on this gallery here. Like, mm -hmm. sorry, people, you're not you're not getting over there. So <laughs> clearly, wow. you know, it's worth it for them to do that to protect their their daughter. But I can imagine that you know, after the hanging boy incident, that probably just the sheer threat alone was enough to keep the suitor's feet firmly on the ground. <laughs> they weren't necessarily going to go shimmying up any poles. Uh, you know, dad and a gun, Romeo spikes, one or the other. It's just not going to end. Mm -hmm. is done. Um, so um, ghost stories are one of those things that are so embedded in the New Orleans culture. There is something that, you know, 
We have everything from the Rougarou and the swamp that we tell stories about to keep our children under control because he only eats the bad children. And, you know, he comes in there and like, the swamp, you know, this big werewolf guy and the Rougarou is awful. Uh, so you don't want any encounters there. You know, if you're a bad kid, the Rougarou is coming for you. And then everything from that to you know, the Axeman of New Orleans who liked jazz music and put ads in the paper to announce his his coming and his stipulations for sparing people horrible acts related deaths. I'm losing battery. Can you, I'm going to log out here. Can you log me back okay. in? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you come back in when you get back in the waiting room there. But the, there's so many fun stories. So, but New Orleans is not immune. You know, they're well, not immune. They're not the only one with great stories to tell. Lots of people have had their encounters with the New Orleans ghosts, but they are all over the place. Growing up in South Louisiana, I had, you know, we had our own encounters with weird things that we couldn't explain. I did um, reenactments at the Myrtles Plantation, which was one of the most haunted houses in America. Yeah, that sounds murders funny. on the property. Um, I got to, when I was, I was much younger when I did it, but part of my theater days, um, we were a theater troupe that did the reenactments um, during the month of October at the Myrtles. And so I played one of the murder, murdered little girls who just kind of went running through the house once in a while and kind of stood in the, in the windows and it was really kind of fun because they were all fogged up so they could only barely see us. They didn't really, you know, get people out of the corner of their eye and it was really a lot of fun. But the Myrtles Plantation was an interesting place because, you know, you hear so many stories about it. And so we're there to reenact them and we're going, yeah, this is ridiculous. I mean, it's just us. It's, we're the ones here. Um, but <laughs> things would happen. Um, we, at the top of the stairs um, in the main hall, we would smell honeysuckle. And honeysuckle um, in October was weird. <laughs> that was yeah. we looked everywhere wow. for the flowers, for a candle, for something. There was nothing. Um, in South Louisiana, lore honeysuckle is the smell of the spirits. And so it, that lets you know, kind of like the cold chill mm. in the room. Um, mm. Honeysuckle will let you know that someone from beyond is is hanging out there. Um, that's kind of their way of making themselves known. Um, another evening, we were outside kind of just in between tours, just kind of hanging out in the backyard, getting some air. And um, there was not a breath of wind. There's rarely a breath of wind in South Louisiana. Um, right. And there was there were three rocking chairs on the back porch of the Myrtles, and the one in the middle started to very slowly rock. Oh. Um, Ooh, there, was no there was no wind, and we're just staring at that chair. We watched it for a little while. We walked around the house and back in the front door. <laughs> not going on that porch. Um, but as we stood there watching the rocking chair just rock, I mean, oh we God. figured, you know, unless somebody's just sitting out there in the evening, whatever. You know, it was, it was not a, a feeling of like yeah. fear, but that was odd <laughs> for the middle yeah. rocking chair. Oh, you smell the pipe tobacco or something. You're like, oh my God. Exactly. Yeah. Like we, were, we were just waiting on someone to materialize in the chair. Yeah, totally. <laughs> we're going so around creepy. now. <laughs> it's the yeah, background. that's so and creepy. And if I had been alone, I would have thought, you know, I've made that up. But there were a few of us. <laughs> we're standing, we just looked at each other. We all started moving. It was like, nope. <laughs> but it, I mean, that's. I haven't had a lot of experiences, but those were, that was two things that we never could quite explain about the Myrtles Plantation. So if you guys ever had anything like that happen to you, wherever you are, or someone you know. Uh, mm, well, I, I have, every year I have a Deadwood fan party um, in Deadwood, South Dakota. And Deadwood, like New Orleans, uh, is very, you know, notorious, gunslinging, all that kind of um, gold rush days, and a lot of violent deaths and ghosts. Um, and one year we had it in the basement of a haunted hotel, and we were having some adventures with some of the ghosts as it was, and there was a psychic there who'd been on one of the shows, one of those TV shows, um, you know, with we all have seen him. Anyway, and he was talking to me, and he, he told me, you know, we were talking about this other ghost and he's like, oh, and, and by the way, you have uh, one att a spirit attached to you. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Please don't tell me it's some kind of demon thing. I, I you know, I'm not going to do well with that. <laughs> yeah, nice. but, um, it was really cool because he, now he would not have a clue, but he, 
he said she was an older lady, um, older woman, and she's guarding me. And then he said my grandmother's, the first part of my grandmother's name. And she, had, when my daughter was born at the same time, I couldn't go to her funeral. I went later. Anyway, he said the first um, half of her name, which is not a normal name. He said her name sounds like, you know, this, and it was, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, and before that and after that, you know, I'm, I'm a dud, I always say, when it comes to, you know, ghosts. I just don't see, you know, I don't seem like I have the experiences. And I've done lots of haunted houses, uh, worked with paranormal investigators studying for the books. But I, ever since, you know, before that sometimes and ever since after, there's things that happen now that, and, and we just now in my family, we just say, hey, grandma, you know, or I'll say, watch over me. This is getting scary in here, you know. Don't let anything come too close. Um, but yeah, it was it was really trippy. <laughs> and my sister was there on the other side of the room talking to somebody, and I went over and I said, "So this is happening on the other side of the room." And I kind of filled her in, and she was just, "What?" <laughs> I mean, it was so funny to see her expression after I came down from the what. <laughs> so yeah. Um, We've had some fun stuff happen. We do a lot of paranormal investigated tours when we're there um, with fans for the fan weekend. And so there's been some fun stuff like that happening. I love that. And I love um, with New Orleans, we go there, we go to Florida almost every Christmas to see some friends of my, um, my kids' friends that moved away. And we always make a point of stopping in New Orleans, you know, whether we stay at a plantation, visit plantations that are haunted or whatever. So I love, that's what I loved reading about your books was, I get to be there. I get to be in it. I've been there so many times. I've walked the quarter in all different times of the year. Now I get to see it through your eye, you know, way back when. So that was great. That was a lot of fun. I love the city because so little has changed. You can walk by those same houses and, you know, that maybe they've changed names. Maybe the hotel is a different place, you know, but the buildings themselves are still there, you know, it, you can still feel that age and the stories that they have to tell. Um, the, ar the architecture is just staggering that it could stand there for 300 years and essentially still be the same building. Um, remarkable. I mean, we can get into that in another show, Annie, about how they actually do that and some of the architecture there when we get into our New Orleans history, because it's actually pretty fascinating how those buildings are still standing after all of this time, especially with the climate that they have and the weather that they have. Um, Carrie, what about you? I honestly, no. I'm fine having a, you know, go stop by, but not, nothing, nothing like that has ever happened. I've had some kind of weird, unexplainable things. You know, I'm a little bit more kind of almost on the psychic side. Oh. Yeah, you know, there, there's like, um, I was, I kind of always hesitate to talk about this, but it was so long ago that I, I'm not sad now. So um, my husband died um, quite some time ago and it was a tragic death. And it, it was like the weird thing that happened was he had gone out riding his motorcycle and uh, had never came home. But the night before that happened, I woke up and was swore he was not in bed. I woke up and I, he wasn't there and I went looking for him and I couldn't find him and I came back and he was right there, had been all along. And then, you know, the next day he went out and when I woke up was not there and did not come back. So it was like, I had this weird little, I've had stuff like that happen, like the foreshadowing, knowing yeah. thing, mm -hmm. you know. I had this dream once where I was driving um, a familiar road to pick up my kids. They stayed with a friend and the road was slippery and I hit a corner and I was going too fast and I went off. And the next day I'm driving to pick up my kids from school on that road. And I had forgotten the dream until I was coming up on that corner. And I was like, oh my God, this is the dream. And I slowed way down and I got to the corner and it was really slippery. And I was like, you know, wow. I've had things like that happen, which gives me all the little shivers. But yeah, but I've never had a ghost and, and I've kind of, you know, I've been places where I was kind of thinking maybe I might right. get that experience, but they don't like me or something. I don't know. <laughs> I have a friend who says I always bring them back with me because mm -hmm. there's like things will weird things will start happening. Like when I've come back from New Orleans, but you know, maybe nothing there, you know, when I'm there, but you know, we've 
I had weird things happen like in the school theater after spring break because I've gone to New Orleans over spring break and I come back and like weird things start to happen and sounds and other people are hearing things and the other director just looks at me and says, will you quit bringing this food back from New Orleans? <laughs> <laughs> we have a show to do. And I'm like, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I'll ask him to leave. All right. uh, Annie, what about you? Well, uh, I, I have a ton of things, but the mo the three short things that stand out are uh, I used to live in uh, Hanson, Virginia, uh, which is near Fort Monroe, which is known for their ghost stories from Civil War. And I had friends that lived in a home and we had to move them because there were ghosts. Uh, mm. And plenty of their homes had actually be moved by the government because of ghosts, you know, activity. Wow. Uh, paranormal activity, excuse me. Uh, they moved in. I remember the cabinets moving, the toilet being flushed, things like that. Uh, wow. So we moved them out really fast. And they were like, no, we want to stay. You know, <laughs> we love this. Uh, but, you know, the yeah, but the government makes them move out because um, accidents have happened. Oh. Um, with soldiers and stuff. So they make you move out and now it's no longer a base or whatever. So that's true. That's Look creepy. it up. Yeah, it's very interesting. But as far I've had a, a lot of experiences like Carrie, I feel I'm pretty intuitive as a person in nature, uh, by nature, whatever. But the main things were like when I was in a car accident when I was 18, I broke my neck, but my boyfriends and I were in an eight, a driving a high truck to drive. And I said, I don't feel safe. We need to be in your little Mazda RX-7. He joked around that I wanted to be in the slick car. And I was like, no, no, no. I think we need to be in a lower car. And it was right. We were right. 18 wheeler jackknife from the other side of the road. Wow. If we were in the high truck, we would have be gone. Wow. And it was like the talk of school wow. for a while when I, because I went right back to school that Monday with my brace and everything. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And, you know, but you know, but I, knew, I knew something was going to happen, right? But I we didn't stop because I didn't know what, you know? And then um, the other one was I had an ex-boyfriend who was uh, sucked into the end during the Persian Gulf oh. War. He was on the USS Roosevelt. And it was like the first couple of days of the war. And he would wave the, the uh, pilots, okay, you can like leave the landing to fly off, whatever. whatever. And uh, he got sucked into the intake. Oh, he my survived. goodness. He survived. He survived? Yes. Wow. Yes, he was on all How those, did you survive he was, that? He was on That's all unbelievable. those shows. I'll tell you, he was on those shows, I survived everything. Mm. They still, they still wow. play on YouTube and everything. Wow. And he, um, I, I woke up in the middle of the night, ran to my best friend's room. I'm still best friends with her. And I was like, Susan, something's wrong with JD. She's like, oh God, Annie, you're so dramatic. I was like, no, he's hurt. He's hurt. Stayed up all day. We did get the call from the ship, from the Red Cross ship that he was taken there. He was injured. You watch it, he comes out backwards, straight, and lands on the ground. His captain said, Angels grabbed his feet and pulled him out. And to this day, I think it was me waking up. Huh. Wow. As stupid as it sounds, like not me. <laughs> my my angels went and said, Phew. Mm. That's what I think. Wow. Wow. What a very cool story. Wow. That is awesome. Well, guys, I know, um, Anne, you've got to start off. So thank you guys so much for joining us. It's been a little while here. So I think we will call it a night for tonight. But thank you guys for watching. Those of you are out there um, commentating, we will get back in there and as um, soon as we can and check on some of those comments and chats as well. You guys have been so much fun. Thank you for joining us tonight and chatting with us for so long. Annie, thank you for getting us all together. This Thank has you, been a tremendous amount of fun. Would you like to say anything, Annie, before I, we I wrap up? Let everybody know, upcoming, we have people like Vanessa Lilly. Uh, Fre 
I can't remember everybody's names. Uh, but um, but also Art uh, Bell. Well, yeah, tell them about him, please. I'm rather breath. He he is the creator of Comedy Central, and he has a book coming out in the uh, middle of September. So he's going to join us September 23rd. Wow! And his book is you know how he created Comedy Central and lost his sense of humor. So he's going to join us on uh, September 23rd. Carla Vergat is going to join us on August 26th. So we've got more shows coming down the pipe, guys. So please Great. join us. Um, we're looking forward to hanging out with you sharing some bits from our life, some history, some news, some book buzz, and all of those good things, as well as some great author chats. But thank you so much to our inaugural guests for yes. making this a fantastic show. Thank you, so much. Um, you guys are the best, and we just appreciate you so very much for jumping on this wild ride with us and spending this part of your night and your midweek. So, and I know you've got to run, so we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much, guys. Night, We've got our...